Welcome to AP Human Geography, Chapter 9, Key Issue 3. As always, I'm your excited and amazing host, Andrew Patterson. We're going to look at why are energy resources important for development. Energy demand and supply. So supply, this is the quantity of something producers have available for sale. And demand is, of course, the quantity consumers are willing to buy. If you've got a huge supply of eggs, but you don't have the consumers wanting to buy it, then you've got a problem because you can't sell the money you put into all of your chickens and, and facilities for all your eggs. So we've got to have a good demand along with the supply. So as far as energy, we're looking at the demand and supply of fossil fuels. Now we should know that fossil fuels are the energy source formed from residue of plants and animals buried millions of years ago. Years ago. Specifically, we're looking at coal, petroleum, and natural gas. The heaviest consumers of fossil fuels are developed countries, but most resources are found in developing countries. So we've got a problem there, right? So if we've got these huge cities and technologies and, and people in developed countries, and we need to go to developing countries to get all this stuff, what do you think is going to happen? That's right. Developed countries are going to take advantage of developing countries. <clears throat> so we look at the percentage of uh, what's being used uh, globally here, I believe, and we've got mostly petroleum that's going to be used up here. So the oils and gases. Uh, second to that is coal and then natural gas. So we're getting huge amounts of all of our energy from these products. The demand for energy. Half the world's energy is consumed in developed countries. Of course, that leaves the other half to be consumed in developing countries. Um, of the two huge ones here that are devouring energy is the United States and China. They consume the most. Developed countries have far less people, but they use way more energy per capita, and it's so much higher. Per capita is per person. So you think about that. <clears throat> you know, we like to maybe, in a way, look down on sub-Saharan Africa for not being as developed, but we're the ones using all of this energy. I mean, we consume so much more energy because think about it. If you've got one person in the USA, they're using air conditioning, they're using television, internet, lighting, uh, power, all of this stuff, all this energy being used for their huge houses, whereas sub-Saharan African people, maybe they're using none or very little. So think about all the businesses, all the homes, everything in transportation that's using energy. Energy supply. Why do some regions have abundant supply? Let's look at coal. The main reserves are in mid-latitude countries like China and the United States. Think about you know, Pennsylvania and all these areas that have great coal reserves in the United States, um, but also China. They're doing really well because they, can, they have access to coal. Petroleum, Russia. Saudi Arabia, Southwest Asia, and the United States. You think, well, why is the United States so successful? Well, we've got a lot of coal, we've got a lot of petroleum, we've got a natural gas, and as far as development and energy that we need to run our economy and businesses, we've got the resources. Same with Russia, same with China. These, that's why these big three are so huge right now. And again, uh, natural gas, Russia, Southwest Asia, and the United States. So, there's two forms of energy. We've got renewable energy, which is essentially unlimited. Think of hydroelectric or water, geothermal, things that are from within the earth, fusion, wind, biomass, and solar. These things can theoretically go on forever without being used up. And then you've also got non-renewable energy. These uh, forms of energy are so slowly created that it's, for practical purposes, it can't be uh, re re renewed. I'm sorry, guys. Chapter 9, I just have not done the greatest job at spelling what needs to be spelled right. And I apologize for that. You know, these videos are for you, and I have let you down. I am so sorry. Um, I don't know what it is about Chapter 9. It's just like I'm tongue-tied and I can't spell right. <clears throat> I do enjoy it, though. I like Chapter 9. In any case, non-renewable energy, it can't be renewed. Think of fossil fuels. So if we use up all the oil, there ain't no more. And that could be a problem if our whole economy is dependent on oil. Energy reserves. Well, just like I said, the world faces potential issues with population growth, rapid development, and limited reserves. 
we have to ascertain what are our proven reserves and what are potential reserves. So as far as proven reserves, this is the supply of energy remaining in deposits that have been discovered. With coal, looks like we got about 131 years left. That's it. As far as we know, only 131 years left, which seems like a decently enough long time. I'm, I think you and I are going to be able to live with coal, but think about our children. There's going to be apparently no coal left for them from what we know. Natural gas, we got 49 years left of current demand. That's not good. Okay, that means we're going to run out. Petroleum, 43 years left at current demand. How much gas do we use? How many cars do we have in, uh, on our, our American streets? Uh, think about the entire earth, how many cars are running. 43 years left? Let's see. At the making of this video, I'm 41. I darn sure want to be uh, alive when I'm 84. So I'm hoping I'm not running out of petroleum. Actually, more than that, I'm hoping that we're running on uh, renewable resources, uh, such as electric or solar or something like that. But this is, at least by Rubenstein's textbook, where we are. So we look for potential reserves. These are undiscovered supply deposits. Where can we look for stuff? If we're about to run out of uh, gas and petroleum, where can we look? Well, there's still undiscovered fields that hold natural gas and petroleum. that we just, we just don't know where they are yet in the earth. We can also enhance the recovery of already discovered fields. There's new techniques and strategies for getting more use out of petroleum fields that have been thought to be unaccessible or already dried or used up. Um, whether you like it or not, they've got a new system called fracking that they've been using for a while, but it's pretty controversial because they're sending what they say is safe for the earth back down into the earth to force out natural gas. But if you start reading into all the material that's in fracking, uh, it seems to be pretty toxic. So again, we're looking at potential reserves and options there. And unconventional sources. Where else can we find more coal and natural gas and petroleum? Well, let's look where we haven't looked before. So we look at <clears throat> our petroleum reserves here. Of course, we want to look at the United States first. Well, here's our petroleum reserves. We don't have that much. Canada has got tons. Saudi Arabia has a whole bunch, and that's why, um, you know, we always considered uh, oil and why we're going into the Middle East and, and dealing with the Saudis. It's because they've got a whole bunch of petroleum, and we're going to need it as we load here. You know, this is another opportunity to tell you a story. Okay, <clears throat> when I was a young lad, I wanted to be, ah, oh, darn it. Well, for another time. Controlling petroleum reserves. If we've got a whole bunch of oil, how are we able to ration it or control it so where, you know, we have some for ourselves and not everybody just takes it and uses it all up? Well, OPEC, the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, they decided to band together, or band together, yeah, and uh, make this pact here to control the petroleum reserves. This enabled um, oil rich countries to have more control meaning they weren't just selling it to multiple countries and doing whatever countries like United States and England were asking. They kind of got together and said, let's control the cost and how we are selling and who we're giving our petroleum to. So you had developed countries that were extracting for cheap, and they sold it for cheap back in the United States and the United Kingdom. So these oil countries like Saudi Arabia, they, they didn't get much profit. So they came together and said, let's control it. Members include Algeria, Iraq, Kuwait, Libya, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Angola, Ecuador, Iran, Nigeria, and Venezuela. So while the U.S. production remains constant, demand is increasing and it's met by its imports. So the U.S., it imports a whole bunch of its, its oil. And we have to deal with OPEC. This is why when you hear about this in the news, it, it can be concerning because we want to make sure that these countries here are still getting us oil at a rate that's feasible for our consumers, people in this country to handle. Because if all of these members in OPEC got together and said, you know what, we're going to charge a whole bunch more for oil, it would be a problem. It would snow, slow down transportation. Uh, it would increase the cost of lots of goods and services because it's all delivered by truck these days or ships coming across the ocean, and if it costs a whole bunch of money to ship it, 
then we're going to buy a lot less and less and it's going to be more and more expensive. So think about it here. As far as production, this is our production in the United States. This is, just think of it as the amount of oil that we're needing, the oil that we're using. Well, our consumption is going up. We are uh, using more and more and more oil. Here's how much oil we're, we're making or getting ourselves. So we can't, there's a gap here. We have to fill it with something. So we've been filling it with imports. So more and more, we definitely have to continue dealing with OPEC because we continue to import. Now, we do have oil reserves in the United States, but we don't necessarily tap them. We're depending on imports right now. This is a look at the U.S. petroleum sources in barrels per day. So in 1973, we were getting a lot of our own oil, 69%, in fact, and getting some from Canada and some from Venezuela. These were our big areas. Fast forward to 2012 at the printing of this book, and you can see that we've dropped by a significant amount here. We're not getting as much oil from our own country. We're still getting a whole lot from Canada, in fact, even more, and we're dealing with Saudi Arabia in a much bigger piece of the pie. We're dealing with OPEC countries here. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily mean that we don't have oil because we do have reserve. It's just that we are depending on the imports right now to get our oil. Let's look at the oil price history. So back in 1970, we had oil companies in developed countries controlling the supply of oil in Southwest Asia, and they are keeping prices low. No problem for us as consumers in the United States. We're, you know, we're driving cars and we're getting gas for really, really cheap. Then in about 1973, we've got the OPEC countries refusing to sell oil to countries, including the United States, because it was in war with its neighbor Israel. Okay, let me state that again. Uh, OPEC countries were um, supporting is excuse me. OPEC countries were against Israel. Think about it. If you got Muslim countries, they are against Israel because Israel tends to be uh, Jewish and Christian, backed by the United States and the United Kingdom. So Muslims aren't too happy with that. So these OPEC countries are Muslim for the most part, and this is when the price of gas went up because they made it go way, way up. 1973. Just think about the 1973 war with uh, Israel. Fast forward. Um, OPEC lifts its boycott, but it raises prices. Right. So the price of oil goes up. In just before 1980, we had a revolution in Iran, and you've got the Iran-Iraq war. It triggers oil shortages and higher prices, so it gets jacked way, way up. So I remember in the 80s when you know we wanted to go on a summer vacation when I was a young kid, and we couldn't because the price of oil went way up. As a matter of fact, I was supposed to go to Disney World, and this situation right here ruined it for me because my dad was... Uh, a minister and we had a limited amount of income so we could not afford the gas no joke okay fast forward we're coming close to the 90s we got the end of the iran iraq war and it brings increased supplies and lower, lower prices so gas is coming way back down in the early 90s here it was great as i started to go into college because i can afford to go all the way up to kansas my freshman year gas prices were low and uh, it was no problem but as we fast forward and get into 2005 and beyond we see prices rise as demand for oil in developing countries increases. That's right. We've got more and more people, more and more industry and development. We've got gas continuing to go up and up and up. These prices are going to increase because guess what? We need more. And OPEC countries know this. They know that we need it. We know that our demand is high. And so they're going to limit the supply and they're going to charge more. I don't know why my computer is not loading so fast these days. I'm thinking it's dealing with the Internet and I apologize. So we look at alternate energy sources. Nuclear, this is another option. Instead of using petroleum or natural gas, let's use nuclear. It's not renewable, but a large amount of energy is released from a small amount of material. Consider that one kilogram of enriched nuclear fuel contains more than two million times the energy that one kilogram of coal does. That's huge. So you have this tiny little bit, and it's going to release tons of energy. Well, there's some issues with it because um, you have potential accidents. When you create fission, um, you have radioactive waste. Here's three examples. And actually, Three Mile Island was not in our textbook. Rubenstein didn't happen to put that in there, but in Pennsylvania in 1979, they had an issue where they had to evacuate a lot of people. They didn't tell people 
but they finally ended up, uh, you know, evacuating people and they had a near meltdown in the United States of America with our power plants. Chernobyl in uh, Russia, which is now in the Ukraine, 1986, you had a huge meltdown. The area is still not even occupied. And then Fukushima power plant in Japan in 2011, big, big deal where you have radiation all over the place because the power plant was destroyed. Well, it was messed up after uh, the, uh, what was it, the earthquakes. So we've got issues potentially with uh, nuclear power plants. Other issues are that uh, uranium, which is needed to create nuclear power, it's limited. These reserves come in at a high cost, and it's very expensive to maintain these power plants. So we look at, we want to use nuclear? Okay, well, there's a limited amount of uranium. So where is the most uranium? It's got Australia. Australia is a huge place for it. Some in Canada, some in the United States. Kazakhstan, another big area where uranium reserves are found. And we're loading. Are we having a good day? I hope you are. I'm, I'm having a good day because I'm getting to talk about AP Human Geography. Let's look at um, power plants. So what we're seeing, first of all, the colors is the percent, from, percent electricity that's created from nuclear power. So, for example, where we are in Texas, we're using about mm, 1 to 20 percent, not very much as far as nuclear power. Um, as opposed to some of these states on the eastern seaboard here, um, where, where we're getting like 40% and above, like consider that maybe there's 50% um, nuclear power being created in Virginia here. Same with Illinois. Look at all these power plants. So in Texas, where we live, Dallas-Fort Worth is about right here. And we've got these nuclear power plants right here. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of them. I know it. I just can't think of it right now. But these are, I don't know if you even realize that, Dallas-Fort Worth, but we've got nuclear power plants right next to us operating. Um, think about Chicago and, and Illinois. How many power plants nuclear are, are going on here? So many. Could be a lot of potential problems. If you're over here and you're in Pennsylvania, you know, New Jersey, New York, Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Philadelphia, look at all these power plants right around you that are running by nuclear. Now, maybe it's no problem at all, but... You know, it's something that I like to think about because it potentially could be a big hazard. Renewable energy. We've got hydroelectric power generating electricity from the movement of water. This is an option for us. Biomass. Biomass is derived from plant material and animal waste. It includes wood and crops, but it tends to be really inefficient and it can reduce the forest because if you're using wood to fuel your power plants, you're going to be cutting down a lot of forests. Although I've watched a lot and done a lot of research on biomass, and actually it could be a really viable option because a lot of the crops, when we extract what we need as far as food for people or animals, naturally what's left is a lot of this product that we wouldn't do anything else with, which would be great for biomass. So that could be a great option. Wind, potentially there's tons of it, and it's free. The problem is that those big windmills, they modify the environment. Um, they can be noisy, they can be lethal for birds, and you need a lot of them. Listen, I think it's cool to use engineering across the landscape to create clean energy, but let's be honest, when you have a whole bunch of windmills sitting out, it does modify the landscape. Like, you're, not, you're no longer looking out at this pristine, um, you know, like desert landscape or, or windy mountaintop. Now, a lot of the times, you're seeing these big old windmills. And if you look at those windmills, you know the blades, just one of those blades, if you ever seen a truck carrying a blade driving down the highway, you got to consider that those things are huge. They're bigger than even a semi truck. So when you see those windmills, they're always pretty far away. But think about it: bigger than a semi truck is spinning around in the air. So if you got a flock of birds going past, it could be a problem. I mean, you would think that birds would be smart enough to not go right next to those things, but it does end up happening. Geothermal: this is hot water or steam from the earth. It can be used to uh, create or harness the heat and certainly can be used for energy. Nuclear fusion. This is not yet practical because of extremely high temperatures from smashing hydrogen items. This has been talked about a lot. No one can do it yet. Solar energy. It seems to be the biggest potential with endless free clean energy and I have to admit I've got solar panels all across my house running running everything. It doesn't give me 100% because at the time when I put them in, Texas wasn't allowing solar to be used on 100% of your energy uh, usage there because 
Texas is a oil petroleum uh, state, and they still want to get a lot of their money coming from that to support their industry. But solar energy seems to be like a great idea. There's two things: you get the passive passive solar energy system, where it captures energy without using special devices. And it's just kind of like natural where you might have big windows or you might have dark surfaces that are there painted black to absorb heat from the sunlight. Or you might have an active solar energy system where you've got uh, collecting energy from the sun and it's transferred or converted to heat or electricity directly or indirectly. The biggest thing you think of is like this picture right here, the photovoltaic cell where it converts light into electricity. And that's what we all have on houses. People, those of us, those of us those of us with solar energy, like from places like Solar City. That's a look at Chapter 9, Key Issue 3.